and welcome to a very special episode. Tonight we celebrate scares from the past, stories that have taken place long ago, and lessons that should never be forgotten. It's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. Number one. My grandmother is getting pretty old now, and she tells this story pretty often. In the 60s, she took her three young kids and left her abusive husband. The only house she could afford to rent at first was a ramshackle four-room farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. It didn't even have indoor plumbing. It just had an outhouse, and a well at the back where they drew water. According to her and my mother, every night at around 2am, they would hear the back door in the kitchen unlock and open. It was an old door, and both these actions had very distinctive, unmistakable sounds. They would then hear heavy footsteps walking across the creaky kitchen floor to the water bucket and the water dipper would rattle against the bucket like someone was dipping out a drink of water. And then nothing. It started to scare the shit out of her, of course. But once she ascertained that no one was breaking and entering, so there was no one to shoot, she settled down. In her eyes, whatever was happening isn't harmful. My mother, on the other hand, was the only kid old enough to really understand what was happening, and it freaked her out. So my grandmother decided to get her sister, my great aunt Sue, to stay over one night. They planned to sit up and see what the hell was going on. My mother was not going to join them at first, but she couldn't sleep and felt safer in the room with them. So she was there as well when two o'clock rolled around. They were sitting at the kitchen table drinking coffee, when they heard the back door unlock and swing open. The thing is, they were staring straight at it, and it didn't move. Same with the footsteps and the water dipper. They saw nothing, even though they could hear it, clearly, even discern the direction of the noises. That was pretty much that. It kept happening every night. They didn't stay in that house long because my grandmother found a job and a better rental closer to town. And my mother was super happy to get out of there. My grandmother still talks about it sometimes, and it's strangely hilarious. Because she's so unbothered by it. Because, I mean, I would pee my pants. But the last time I asked her why it didn't scare her, she just said, well, shit. He was just thirsty. Number two. These stories were recounted to me by my grandmother whilst reminiscing about old memories. And the following accounts take place in the mid-1920s when my grandmother was a young girl. About the age of five or six, she started talking to an imaginary friend who she called Hather. My grandmother said that they would spend their days playing in the backyard and exploring the property behind the house, which was basically just a large woodland area, plus a small lake that was usually dried up in the warmer months. They never ventured into the woods. They kind of just hung around playing on the swing set and picking flowers. But my grandma said that Hather was always scared to go near the lake when it was full of water, and she never understood why. Hather would never tell her the reason why she got so afraid. As my grandmother got a little older, she said that she stopped seeing Hather around. No big deal to her, as they were other neighborhood kids to play with. But not long afterwards, a friend of my grandmother's stopped for a visit and brought with her some photos. My grandma hung around the two adults and looked at the pictures. Upon doing so, she comes across a photo of a little blonde girl with blonde pigtails and is dressed in the clothes 
that were popular for girls in the early 1900s. My grandma chirps in, That's Heather. My grandma's mother's friend looks at the photo and asks how my grandma knew this little girl. That's Heather. She was my friend, but I don't see her anymore and she went away. My grandma's friend then goes on to tell them that Heather was a little girl who had lived in the neighborhood a few years prior to my grandma and her moving in, and that Heather had drowned in the lake behind the house. As it turns out, Heather may have not been an imaginary friend after all. Number 3. This story takes place around 1930. I'll preface by saying that my grandma says, what takes place in this story is the reason why she's so afraid of looking out at windows at night. My grandmother, who's now divorced, worked as a maid for a very wealthy man in their town. Because she was divorced and didn't have enough money for her own house since she was supporting herself and a small child, the man offered them a room to stay in, in exchange for working for him. Which makes him sound kind enough. But apparently he was very verbally abusive towards them. Although, they just took his abuse as being just how men of this time acted, and didn't think too much of his words. But after a while, his behavior did start to wear on them. So my grandmother began working towards saving up enough money so that they could leave and get a place of their own. She knew the man would be furious if he found out that she was trying to leave, as he had become very possessive of both of them. So one night, not long after my grandmother had earned enough money to leave, they quickly and quietly gathered up their things, which weren't much at the time, and my grandmother was quickly ushered towards the window by her mother. As my grandmother reached out to open the window, she let out a scream. Peering in through the pitch black window was the face of the man, with a look of pure rage contorting on his face. He held up a large butcher knife and banged it against the window, yelling, If you try and leave, I shall slit both of your throats. My grandma's memory of how the rest of the night played out was hazy, as it was such a long time ago and it was such a traumatic event that she tried to forget. All she can remember is, she and her mother had to stay there a few more months before they attempted another escape, and this time, they were successful. Number 4 This last story happened to my grandmother later in life. Somewhere around the 70s, when my grandmother remarried after her first husband passed away, she and her second husband moved into a house that was something like a hundred years old. Not long afterwards, my grandma reported being awoken every couple of nights or so by the sound of bagpipe music, which sounded like it was coming from their front room, which was just down the hallway from her bedroom. She rarely ever got up to investigate and would just lie there in the darkness too frightened to move and wouldn't be able to go back to sleep until the music had stopped. But one night, she got up to use the bathroom, leaving the lights off, and on her way back down to the hallway to her bedroom, she heard the bagpipe music playing. She stood frozen in the hallway, when she saw a man standing in the front room, dressed in a kilt and everything, and playing the bagpipes. He was standing with his back to her, and she took the chance to run into her bedroom and slam the door. Now it all sounds very comical in a way, but my grandmother was petrified to actually be witnessing a ghost for the first time since childhood. As an aside, it's worth mentioning that this wasn't the only creepy thing that happened around this house. The next incident occurs a couple of years later. My grandmother's husband owned a caravan that he kept around the back and was filled with most of his stuff from his previous marriage that he just couldn't bear to get rid of. But my grandmother didn't want it in their house. Now, the two things in the caravan were a pair of marionette puppets 
that had belonged to his daughter from the previous marriage. His daughter had passed only years prior, and it was the only thing of hers that he had decided to keep, and he stored them in a caravan because they creeped my grandmother out, and with good reason. Now fast forward to the early 1980s, when my older brother was a little kid, and he would stay at my grandmother's house on occasion. His memory is also hazy on this. He did sleep in the caravan once, and was awoken in the middle of the night by a scratching and scraping sound. The noise stopped not long after he woke up, and since he was young, he shrugged it off and went back to sleep right away. But when he woke up in the morning, he found that the two marionette puppets that were in the room with him were in different positions than the previous night, like the head of one of them was facing a different direction than when he last saw it when he fell asleep, and the arm of the other was no longer by its side, but was up and pointing out of a window. My brother was scared, and he never slept in the caravan again, but my grandmother's husband spent a lot of time in there during the day, working, and there were many reports of him looking up every so often, and the position of the marionette having changed only a couple of minutes since the last time he had glanced at them. Even though he'd never heard a sound from them, he said he was oddly soothed by it, as he thought he could feel the presence of his daughter in the room with him, as he felt that she was still playing with the marionettes even after her death. Number 5 Back in the mid-1960s, my grandfather was 18 at the time. His younger sister, her fiancé, and a friend we all call Mike, decided to mess with the Ouija board that Mike had gotten. According to my grandfather, no one believed in it. Even though my grandfather's family were quite religious, they didn't believe that a spirit nor demon could really manifest through a toy. They got to playing, asked at the usual stuff. We all know the drill. Suddenly, his sister asked, When will I die? And it spelled out, Soon. My grandfather didn't think it was very funny that Mike was trying to scare her. His sister egged it on, asking for different details and specifics, until finally the board spelt out, 19 and train. They all scoffed. There weren't any trains near their town, and they left their town maybe once a year. They call it quits and forget about it. Fast forward a few months, October 19th of that year, my grandfather's sister was surprised by a gift from her fiancé with a trip to a large nearby city to see a show. Later that night, the police informed my grandfather's family that there had been an accident. The fiancé had tried to beat the train because they couldn't wait a few minutes for the train to pass at the crossing, and it had been hit, killing both of them instantly. I found all of this out for the first time when I was six, when I asked my grandfather if we could get a Ouija board like the one we saw on the paranormal slash ghost show that we were watching. Obviously, he said no. Number 6. This happened to my father when he was in his early 20s. He is from a small town in Mexico, and he and his cousin walked to a town about 5 miles away. Well, once in the neighbouring town they made their way to the local watering home. They were having such a good old time they didn't realise it was so late. So, they're ready to leave, but by this point it's 11pm. Dreading the long walk back, they see a horse that is tied to a tree. Look, we have a taxi, my father says. Both of them get on the bareback horse, with my dad's cousin in the front and my dad in the back. My dad and his cousin are euphoric. They are singing and are just giddy that they have found a horse to ride. They figure that once they get to their town, they'll just shoo the horse away and it will find its way back to its owner. So they are having the time of their lives, when all of a sudden, just out of nowhere, this huge dog runs up to them, 
It is growling and barking, and the worst part is it's trying to knock both my dad and his cousin off the horse. Then it goes back to try and bite them. All the while the horse is spooked, and is just jumping up on its legs. Well, in those days, everybody carried a handgun. My dad and his cousin were no different, probably dealing with a rabid dog. So my dad takes out his gun, and point blank shoots the dog in the head. At this point, my dad knew that he hit the dog, as he saw it hit its head. But the dog just shook it off and continued to lunge at them. At this point, my father is asking, "Well, it's a rabid dog." So I must shoot it until he possibly can't get up anymore. So he empties his six shooter into the dog. Same thing, the dog just shakes it off. Then my dad unholsters his cousin's gun, and fires all the bullets into the dog. Same thing, the dog becomes even more vicious. At this point, my dad says he felt the biggest chill he's ever felt surge through his body. They take off on the horse, while the dog was chasing them. But finally, they see that the dog is being outrun, and is staying further and further back. Once they reach the entrance of our village, there is no sign of the dog, so they dismount and shoo the horse back. They both run to their houses, having sobered up pretty quickly, and the next day they both decide to check the area where the dog appeared, and they couldn't find a trace of blood whatsoever. Number seven. I grew up in rural Ireland. My dad was eighteen when his father, my grandfather, got ill and became bedbound. One evening, my dad was sitting with his father, talking about various jobs that he needed to do on the farm. After talking for a while, my grandfather asked him if he wouldn't mind going out to the dairy or the milking parlor to get a bottle of whiskey that he kept out there. Probably to hide it from my grandmother, who was a bit too generous with the whiskey when guests came. My father went out to the dairy and was looking for the whiskey. The dairy had one of those little windows on the back that looked out into the farm. On the other side of the window was a pit, where all the cow shit from the winter was kept. If you stood in it, you would sink immediately and suffocate and die. In the most horrific way imaginable, literally drowning in shit. But that aside, my father was looking for the whiskey, and then he heard three solid knocks on the window. Knocks heavy enough to break the window. He stood on the spot because he knew that there was no way anyone could knock on that window, as it was the window facing the pile of shit. With zero access from the other side, after a few moments he snapped out of it and realized what he had heard: death knocks from the banshee. It was a sign that someone close to you would die, and he immediately ran back into the house and up to his father. He found his father dead, with his two hands together as if he were praying. My father believes that if his father knew what was happening, he didn't want him in the room to experience it. My dad said. He had been in a lot of pain that day, and he never did find that bottle of whiskey. Number eight. I grew up in the same house as my grandmother, actually the same one that my grandfather lived in and died in. It's a big farmhouse, and my grandmother had her own living room slash kitchen. The older my grandmother got, the meaner and grumpier she got. She wasn't the nicest person to be around, but she had a soft spot for me. She used to tell me I was going to be a priest. Ha! <laughs> that would have been a dream for her. Her living room was by the stairs, and any time she heard my footsteps, as she could tell who was going up and down the stairs by their footsteps, she would call me into doing something for her or just to chit chat. I enjoyed it, so I would always be happy to call in. She always got out of bed around 6 a.m., and when she got older, she would call me in the mornings to make her a cup of tea, which I always did before going to school. She called me by my full name, Thomas, even though everyone, including my parents, called me Tom. 
When I was 18, though, my grandmother passed away. She was in her 80s and died in her sleep. The funeral was huge, and she got a good send-off. Two days after the funeral, everyone in my family was going back to work. That morning, only my mum and I were left in the house. I was making a cup of tea, and out of nowhere I heard, Thomas! Thomas! I honestly thought I was going mad. I turned to my mother who was sitting at the kitchen table, and her face was white. She had heard it too. I was freaked out by this, but my mum, being a religious woman, calmed me down, and told me that it was her only wanting to say goodbye. My mother claims to have heard it a few weeks later when I left the house to go to university. Number 9 A young couple in the village had built a house close to a known fairy tree. In Irish folklore, fairy trees are surrounded by superstition, and people tend to avoid going near them, touching them, and definitely don't cut them down. When this couple built their house, they damaged part of the tree, but didn't kill it. Plenty of people mentioned it to them, including neighbours, but they shrugged it off as a whole lot of nonsense. Not long after moving into the house, they reported seeing someone watching the house. If they tried to go outside and confront the person, they would be gone by the time they got out. They put it down to children playing a trick on them, and out of the blue one day, it stopped. A year or two later, the couple had a baby boy. When the child was a few months old, the couple decided to have their first night out together. So they hired a local girl as the babysitter. Once she got there, everything was fine, and the couple went out to a pub in the nearest town to listen to some live music. A while after the couple left the baby, it started to cry. The babysitter would settle it, put it back in the cot, and go back to watching TV. At some point, the cry started to get louder, and the baby took longer to settle. The babysitter began feeling anxious, but there was nothing she could do, and didn't have a phone in the house, as she didn't know the number of the pub. At one point, the baby started crying extremely loudly. It was unnatural. The babysitter entered the room and went to the cot, and when she looked down, the baby was crying but it has what she described as the face of an old man. She jumped back in fright, and in the corner of the room, spied someone standing there. They were no taller than a child, but it scared the hell out of her. In a panic, she ran out of the room and out of the house. She ran to the neighbor's house and told them what she'd seen. They came back with her to the house, afraid whoever was in the room would take the baby. When they got there, the baby was crying, and even the neighbours felt something uneasy in the air. One of them went back to the house and called the priest, because back in those days in Ireland, the priest was the person you called in a crisis. He came immediately and had performed a blessing on the house and child. After that, everyone was at ease and the house felt calm again, apart from the babysitter who wanted nothing more than to go home. When the couple arrived home, they were frightened to see so many people in the house. The priest explained the situation, but gave little advice. The neighbours told them it was the fairies, and that they needed appeasing for the damage done to the tree. From then on, the couple left out some tokens for the fairies, food, drinks, coins, and were not bothered anymore. Number 10 we lived on a farm in a while in Ireland, way out in the middle of nowhere, just outside of Ballymahon, in Coe, Westmeath. As the story goes, a man used to come home every night to the house he lived in with his mother. He'd come down the road, come to the back door, go to the hall in the kitchen, and then pull up a chair and sit in the table and have something to eat before going to bed. From her bed, his mother heard him repeat the exact same pattern every night. The last night, though, she heard the door and the steps 
and the sliding chair in the kitchen, as usual, and went to bed, and fell happily asleep knowing her son was home. Only that morning, when she woke up, her son wasn't in the house. When she went outside to look for him, they found him hanging from a tree beside the gate to the field. He would have crossed as a shortcut the last stretch of the road to get home. The gate was left open, by the way, which doesn't make sense, because we all kept cattle in that field, and they would have gotten out easily. The implication was that he never physically made it home that night, but his spirit did. My grandparents moved into that house. And my mother grew up there. My granny claims she heard the ghost herself a few times. But what really gets everyone upset is that when you leave our farm, you have to walk down that lonely road and go right past the gate. And many a time, it just would be wide open, and there would be no way anybody in their right mind would forget to close it behind them, because the cattle would inadvertently get loose. Believe me, when you're a little kid. And have heard that story a few times, and having to walk down that road alone to go make sure the cattle didn't wander off, you don't walk past that gate. You run like hell past it. To this day, some fifty years later, the gate is still there, and so is the tree that the man hung himself from. It's an ugly old-looking thing, the perfect hanging tree, and I still get the creeps every time I go back there and go past it. I never linger there. And every once in a while, the cattle do still get out and block the road, so we have to go and herd them back in. But I never told any of the kids the story that might explain how they got out in the first place. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I have a question to ask you guys. I've noticed that other narrators will use volume numbers for topics in certain videos. I have never done this before, and wondered if you guys think it's worth doing. I need an overwhelming response in the comment section if you guys want me to do this, but if not, things will stay the same. I just want you guys to tell me what you think is best. Don't forget that the merch store is back, so head on over there for some sweet Mortis Media themed apparel, with links in the description. As I mentioned yesterday, my brother just relaunched his history-based YouTube channel, and it would mean a lot to me if you guys would check it out if you're interested. And remember that if you enjoyed today's video, please consider dropping a like and leaving a comment. It's a really great way to help support the channel, and I appreciate it tremendously. And if you'd like to do something incredible and help support the channel further, feel free to visit my Patreon. You can find a link in the description, as well as the links to my social media. And if you want your story read on my channel, you can submit it as a text post to Reddit, or send it to me via email. Both links can be found in the description. But anyway, for now, guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.